Uh, final view um, before we take questions is from uh, John Coughlin. John is now responsible for the DX group in UK and Ireland. Um, previous uh, history uh, in Excel extensively in the logistics sector. Um, yeah, so, John, welcome. Thank you, Ian. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, knowing that I would be following a, a series of presentations from major players across the industry since dawn this morning, including CEOs and chairmen of major players on the operating side and advisors to the industry and indeed, indeed regulators, I was left wondering what would be left to be said when it got to, to my turn um, about any changes in the industry, whether brought about by the recent recessionary environment or indeed the, the trends that have been well talked about this morning. So I, what I thought I would do is to take a somewhat different perspective and, and look at it from the point of view of a, a niche player in the mail and express market and on a personal note from someone who has only relatively recently joined the, the mail industry. And all of that in the last year against the backdrop of what uh, Tim has just spoken about in terms in the UK where I'm primarily involved, we at DX are primarily involved uh, with all those changes that he's talking about in whatever form they actually, they actually percolate through are having dramatic impacts on the, on the market, either in terms of changes or perhaps even indeed uncertainties, uncertainties that they've driven. And in the end, maybe to give some perspective as to why we as a private player have in the round, in fact, supported, supported the Hooper conclusions. Uh, I took over my role at DX Group, as I said, just about a year ago. Um, many of you possibly have heard of DX, but may not know much about what it is, but I'm not going to bore you with the details of that. I've left some notes at the back of my presentation about that. But in the round, we are one of the leading independent players in the UK, and as Tim said, the only player beyond Royal Mail with any form of end-to-end -end delivery capability. Prior to DX, I was spent 10 years at, at um, XL PLC, working with John Allen and, and others in building what became XL PLC until it was taken over by, um, by Deutsche Post just about three years ago. And so for me, the, the major difference in coming into the postal industry was coming up against what clearly is a regulated industry and, and, and with players that are either actual or virtual, virtual monopolies. Uh, and very little competition in absolute contrast to where I've ever worked and in particularly in the logistics industry where competition was at your heels every day, relentlessly driving innovation, customer focus and change. And so for me, that absolutely led to a need to think in, in, in a different way. And on the first day I arrived through the door virtually, the, the, the launch of the, the Hooper Review landed on my desk and I have to say that from my point of view at that stage timing didn't really look ideal um, but on the other hand it did give me an enviable opportunity to um, to actually look at the industry from a from an overall perspective from a bottom up from first principles and see you know what really what really if right were right the industry should look like in the UK and then in the light of that, taking a, a kind of medium term view, what role would be left or should be left for private operators like, like DX. And so we, we started our review by looking at it from the point of view of UK PLC, you know, barring political considerations, which is a huge element of what impacts this, so that's a, that's a, that's a big if, where, where might we end up and what would that actually leave for us in terms of the role of the independence, which as I say was as much a question of of politics as it is of economics. Uh, the conclusions of Hooper uh, and indeed our own in many respects uh, are perhaps unsurprising to, well, to most people in, in, in this room. And although we're looking at the UK, we think there are parallels in the thinking process to at least some if not many other countries across Europe. So firstly from So that's the process, that's our thinking, our conclusions. Firstly, on, on the impact of regulation, uh, and therefore, of course, on, on Royal Mail, even after almost 10 years of gradual uh, market opening and three years after full market opening, Royal Mail's position remains 
the national incumbent and absolutely dominant and by whatever percentage you choose and I'll choose the one that uh, Tim just quoted 99.5% uh, it still absolutely dominates the space uh, I know there's been a lot of activity in in the area of access but one has to question in, in measuring terms value uh, the, in, and activity versus versus some of the statistics that are are, are quoted there and the reason for this continued dominance, frankly, is it's very difficult to enter the market. An entrance needs to have a, a scalable business model, which is very tough. And indeed, I think in entry, in some cases, some people would argue, is in fact discouraged by some of the very measures that have been taken in the, in the access space, and more of that later if people wish. Now, in common with most European, indeed, global postal companies, Royal Mail letter market is shrinking, as Tim and many other people are showing this morning here, largely driven by e-substitution and to a lesser extent maybe by a bit of competition and of course this trend is currently being made worse by the recessionary environment and one of the big question marks or worries for us all is will it return as, as, as the economy does. On the other hand it's also true that the e drivers of e-commerce are going to bring big growth in uh, B2C uh, and in, in home delivery and I think that does favour Royal Mail very strongly with its uh, uh, enviable uh, network ac across the UK. Taking that into account, we, we believe it is very difficult to envisage the emergence of a major competitor to, to rival the scale uh, of Royal Mail and evidence both in the UK and elsewhere I think points to that very strongly. However, we do believe Yeah, we, we do believe that there is um, a, a very important role to be played by niche players such as, such as DX. I mean, we have existed alongside and under Royal Mail's shadow for the last 30 years, since, since the early 70s, providing services that are in some cases similar and in many cases different to what a large network like Royal Mail can or, or wants to do. And, and we believe that you, this can and, and should continue However, for such a vision to be sustainable over the foreseeable future, we think a different form of regulation is key, and, and I'll touch a bit more on that later on. Um, notwithstanding Royal Mail's recent profitability, which you know, has been, 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 been very good in the very recent past, uh, it is generally accepted by virtually everybody that Royal Mail has current and potential major financial problems from the need to modernize and, and, and invest in technology, which of course is going to require funding, which it doesn't have, through to the major pension liabilities that, uh, that Tim spoke of, which is of the order of 10 billion, depending on uh, how you do your calculations. And, and we support the view, perhaps surprisingly in some quarters, that a solution is needed for these problems if Royal Mail is to be sustained and through them through them to, to retain as much value in the postal industry as we can and indeed for, a, for as long as possible. And so for me, ironically and perhaps even paradoxically, we at DX and I personally found myself supporting two major premises that would have previously been anathema to me before entering the postal industry. The first was seeing that we would be looking at supporting measures that would or at least should substantially strengthen the financial viability of a competitor and secondly that we would be arguing for more or perhaps at least different regulation rather than rather than less regulation and both of those to me are absolutely foreign to anything I would ever have believed in or, or thought. Now our stance on financial support comes from our perception of the position of mail in the overall communication media space there is undoubtedly an accelerating migration away from the letter mail towards other media. And our view as a UK operator is that the size and health of the overall UK postal market is to all intents, if not indeed absolutely, linked to the financial health of Royal Mail. If Royal Mail were to falter significantly because of its financial burdens, it would quite likely hugely accelerate the rate of decline of the overall market to the detriment of, of all operators in our view. And so therefore, perhaps somewhat reluctantly, we support the various financial aspects of the Hooper Plan, which would strengthen Royal Mail. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
obviously we and I particularly have some trepidation regarding this conclusion that it won't at some stage in the future return and bite us in the ass as it were. But we've concluded that we are better served by a longer preserved and larger market uh, in, in which, within which then we would have to rely basically on our wits and on our niche status, our flexibility, our customer focus to, to survive and grow and that a share, perhaps a smaller share of a larger pie is definitely better than a larger share of a, a fastly, uh, a quickly diminishing pie. Our stance on regulation as a separate point is that actually it's essential to allow competition to exist and indeed flourish in these kinds of markets, whether it's the UK or indeed elsewhere in my view, but certainly in the UK. Of course, and this is the, this is the, real, the real proviso, provided of course that it's what the powers that be really want, really want to occur. And that brings me to, to, to an interesting point. There is undoubtedly in most countries, and certainly in the UK, in my view, a, a substantial conflict of interest when it comes to the promotion by the government, uh, 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 the promotion or support of competition against the, the, natural, uh, the national incumbent. And obviously political issues impinge on that, whether it's views of social policy around the USO or indeed, as we heard about Switzerland this morning, maintenance of employment to keep the economy going uh, and so on. And so, in my view, where you are dealing, as we are in the UK, with a view of ostensible government support for, for the promotion of competition, it definitely is infected by an element of ambivalence, if not indeed schizophrenia, because on the one hand, the government wants to promote customer service and quality, innovation, etc., and believes that this goal is best achieved by introducing at least some competition into the market and that therefore it should be encouraged. But on the other hand, the government in the UK, in the case of the UK, as the owner of Royal Mail, doesn't want to impair uh, the value of its asset or burden itself with, with ongoing liabilities resulting from such things as USO and so on. So the dilemma therefore for the government is to decide what it wants the role of competition and the market to, to, to be. And in the light of that eyes, what form of regulation it needs to procure to deliver that result. Those who believe in competition and the market, and the market when it works well, and we've all seen evidence in other places where it doesn't work well, but where it works well, I think we believe that competition will not only lead to greater innovation that will benefit customers, but that it will also foster the environment in which Royal Mail itself will progressively become more efficient and modernized, and that, which is a key objective for, 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 all, for all stakeholders. The challenge, therefore, is for them to do enough to promote the change in modernization, but not so much as to have a detrimental, a serious detrimental financial consequences for Royal Mail and, and, and their shareholder. And, and of course, that raises a related pressure of Royal Mail and the government not wanting to over-constrain Royal Mail by, by, uh, by regulation, which Royal Mail contend is, is stifling them. And the problem then overall in my view is, you know, the, 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 the issue is with any actual or near monopoly is the ability of the monopolist, if it chooses, to really stifle any competition by pricing however justified. And frankly, in my own view, given a less fair environment if that was what was allowed to happen, that is exactly what most of us in this room would actually do. So I, I think this for me, was a very tricky thinking process as we worked our way through what, what we should see should happen and certainly in the round of what we were prepared to support, supporting the strengthening of Royal Mail came absolutely hand in hand with the need for right and fair regulation to promote what we believe was the, uh, the conjunction with, with, with the need for, for competition. And before anybody says it, you know, I keep hearing about, well, com isn't that what competition law is there to do? Well, frankly, competition law doesn't respond well, in my view, to this area, not with a, an industry with large networks, many products, and in particular the whole issue around uh, multiple costs and common costs, because um, the, the heart of all of this is about cost justifying prices, and frankly, competition law simply, that competition law framework simply does not, simply does not respond to that, you know, in terms of cost allocations and, and so forth. 
And from what we hear, although I'm not sure I always entirely believe it, you know, the postal industry, and certainly in the UK, is not good at understanding its costs and allocations, and at least that's what appears for those of us looking in from the outside, whether in practice they can or do know more than that is, is another question. I, I leave that to people like, to people like Tim. So, what does all this mean? In my view, that the regulatory regime must be, and I find this, uh, I found this initially a difficult conclusion to come to, but it actually must be quite, quite prescriptive and tight, and critically must lay down an in advance certainty, so that, frankly, you know, issues that might, uh, might be perceived to be egregious aren't only fixed after the event when small players like ourselves have already been actually driven out of the business, that, that just is, is no good. And for us, that is an absolutely vital, vital part of it. Now, the detail of what precise form regulation should take, you'll be happy to hear, is not something I'm going to go on to talk about. Uh, the key point really is the criticality of the philosophy, in my view, that underpins it. In the UK, we now have a fresh opportunity to do this with the handing over of the reins, if it is to occur, from post-com to, to, to off-com. Provided that's handled well, and we're very keen that in the process we don't lose the benefit of the knowledge and the learnings that have been built over the last eight or nine years with POSCOM. Probably not keeping up with myself here. Market needs continuing regulation. Um, one, one last point on that. Uh, we've talked about the re for, for niche players. I think regulation, and I promise you this is the last point on regulation, the regulation in this context should be for the monopoly player, not, not for the rest of the industry, other than where absolutely necessary. And, and in that context, and picking up some of the points that Tim mentioned earlier, we and other private operators in the UK have become very concerned as to the powers that are being sought in this postal bill, which dramatically, if you were to interpret it in a way that it could be interpreted, dramatically extends the scope to businesses and areas that have been far from regulation in the past and that have actually operated very successfully in the past. And I think there are shades in the, in the shadows here of some of these compensation fund points, which I, which, I find, which I find rather worrying. So we, amongst others, have spoken out very loudly against that. And we have, in the, in the last uh, week or so, I think begun to see some evidence that Bear and the politicians are beginning to listen and to be prepared to um, adopt a slightly different approach, but of course, Time, time will tell. I would say, and it may seem ironic uh, uh, or even contradictory, to say that at this point, along with wanting to, on the one hand, support uh, the, the continuing health of Royal Mail, but within a regulatory framework, we also think and we aspire to working more in cooperation going forward with Royal Mail and indeed others in the industry because we think that's, that's the way that's the way the world is moving. We're doing some of that already, and I'll touch on that a bit later. And we did hear this morning in answers, at least, to um, uh, Jean-Pierre Bailly from La Poste that there are cooperations and partnerships with smaller niche players taking place across France. I'm not entirely sure what they are, frankly, but I, I certainly intend to, to go and have a look. Uh, a very quick comment on VAT, given we're in a European environment. Suffice to say, I think it's not much short of an outrage in terms of the absence of a level playing field for such a substantial market that's affected by VAT. It's a 15% price leg up discrimination, however you might call it, in the UK, and it is the equivalent, as I understand it, in many other, in many other uh, European countries, although I heard this morning Poland have, a, have, a, have an interesting way of dealing with that. And in, in my view, that needs to be dealt with. I haven't met anybody who hasn't actually agreed that it is a problem and should be dealt with, but everybody points to Brussels and Brussels doesn't seem to do anything. So certainly from the, uh, the private operator's point of view, one of our, uh, one of our uh, things on our radar screen is to see if there's a common way in which we can push through a sensible conclusion to try and begin to level that playing field. And so if, if all of this does happen, uh, I do believe that there is a great opportunity, and you might think I would say that, but I actually do believe there's a great role and opportunity for niche players like ourselves. And the key to that is innovation and uh, investment in technology, creativity, and last but not least, certainly 
certainly paced. And I don't intend, I'm not doing a very good job at the screen. Um, VAT. I thought what I thought I'd do very quickly is just give you some examples, not drain it to death, but to give some examples of how we're doing that across our own portfolio in DX in the UK and in, indeed in Ireland. Uh, this is our group. Uh, the document exchange is our key product, is the origins of our business, gave the name to our business, largely supporting the legal and professional community. This is an area and, and, and is the area that was started back 30 odd years ago. The model hasn't much changed, but in recent times has been impacted by, by e-substitution. So we have had to look at doing different things, which is a combination of investing in technology for efficiency reasons and customer service, but also in, in extending the scope of services to a, a wide array of customers that we have and indeed trying to make the service more, uh, more meaningful and more relevant to a broader audience. DX Mail, this deals with the other B2B non-DA mail to customers' premises and includes a growing business in, in, in business publications. And here also we've been investing in technological capability and electronic interfaces with customers. D Secure, DX Secure, we, there is a growing demand in, for secure products and this is uh, starting from a strong base that came in with the SMS business uh, uh, three years ago, we have continued to invest in improving that product. A notable aspect of our secure services is that it's predominantly BTC uh, to residential addresses. We also have a network for parcels, which we believe could be a platform for some of the interesting developments in the industry. It primarily focuses on delivery to, to high streets right now and specialist businesses like uh, like opticians and the like. And all of these, in, in terms of the, the, the e-commerce market, uh, we see that there are one of a, a major barrier to our growth in that space has been the lack of a network of, of collection points for both some of the businesses, those two last businesses there, and, and new business we see coming on stream. So we were absolutely delighted to land uh, a groundbreaking deal which was announced only a couple of weeks ago with Royal Mail to use their post office branches as collection of points, at least a subset of them, uh, across the country. And we're about to pilot those in London in the coming weeks. Uh, we think this is a fabulous win for us as it greatly extends our on the ground capability and plays to the greater agenda of UK PLC as enhancing the utilization of, of that national network as well. It also reflects on <coughs> and we've been working some time on this, hopefully we'll be able to grow the pace of these things, but it reflects on whilst competing with Royal Mail, we can also indeed cooperate with them and others, and, and certainly, since certainly that's what we, we plan to do. And finally, we have, uh, haven't quite fully branded it yet, but uh, as a, an example of our plans to, stay, to extend into you know, different but related areas, we bought last autumn uh, a business called DX Business Direct, and VS Direct, we think, is an absolutely fabulous business. It's developed one of, the, one of the UK's largest network of intelligent boxes in the UK called Parcel Exchange, and we're busily working on, on, on extending, extending that capability. Business up to now has been largely focused on secure parcel logistics for field engineers, service part logistics, if you like, and that's a very new, exciting area for us. But it also provides an excellent platform, in my view, for the delivery of e-commerce parcels in the B2C space, and we're, we're, we're working very hard on developing our thoughts and plans in that area. And so, in conclusion, uh, a year on, I, I, I guess I didn't realize what I didn't know when I, when I came into the industry. It is deceptively complex in my view. I think the regulatory environment is is, is exceptionally influential in what happens, and I think people ignore it at their peril, frankly. Uh, our conclusions from the work that we've done over the last year is, you know, Royal Mail is, and will remain for a long time to come, the dominant incumbent, notwithstanding some of the changes in trends of mail and parcels and so on. We absolutely believe if you do the right things, there's an exciting role and opportunity for, for niche players. Innovation and pace are absolutely the key uh, to, to stay ahead and grow. I think right regulation is absolutely essential and that's a, that's a whole chapter in its own right. And last but not least, I think more cooperation across the industry whilst still furiously competing with each other 
is, is definitely a trend to come. Thank you.